Um, welcome everyone to uh, Types and Gradual Typing, part two. And we'll start with the first fun talk uh, by uh, Ichin Xu on degrees of separation. Um, you just lost your... Um, huh. Oh, no, it's back. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Go. Cool. Take it away. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi. So today we are going to talk about uh, data races and uh, how to prevent them. I'm uh, Yi Chen from EBFL, and uh, today it's my pleasure to present our work here. It's a joint work with uh, my EX office mate Alexander and my advisor Martin. So first, let's talk about data races, and they are horrible. Now let's see a real story in a real-world production compiler that puzzled the developer teams for months. So this is a story shared by my advisor, Martin. It's in the early stage of developing Scala 3 compiler. And what happened here is uh, the parallel testing of the compiler randomly errors and clashes in 10 to 50% of the cases. And uh, the numbers are going up. So it's parallel testing and it's random errors and clashes that really sound like a data race, right? But where it is, it's a really a huge database. It's a compiler. So it took months for the team to solve it. And in the end, Martin wrote a static analyzer that rejects all global multiple states unless explicitly marked. So that's uh, how we solved it. And uh, where is it? It's actually a global object that contains a multiple state uh, or multiple states. Uh, it's a seemingly innocent object for translating JVM flags. And uh, how can I know that? It's uh, really a huge surprise to the team. And so needless to say, data races are bad and often they are really difficult to find and fix, so we want to prevent them. But how? Uh, there have been a lot of attempts. And uh, essentially, data races they are caused by concurrent access to multiple data. And uh, where mul multiple threads access the same piece of data, and some of them are mutating it. So there are some type systems that try to detect and prevent data race conditions at compile time with uh, a technique called alias controlling. That is, we use the type system to track the aliases or references to multiple data, and then we restrict them to eliminate data races at the compile time. And of them, one of the most prominent one would be Rust, which is uh, uh, with uh, its uh, ownership system. And uh, <laughs> what we are going to do here, uh, so as we will see shortly, system like safe Rust, it will cl clash with existing programming patterns, and therefore it's quite difficult to migrate existing code or languages to a system like safe Rust. And uh, what we are going to do is to propose a type system for safe concurrency that is flexible enough to be compatible with ex established programming patterns that rely on aliases. So let's first talk about how Rust prevents data races. So this example contains a data race without, uh, needless to say, and uh, here the main function spawns a thread that mutates the vector, and then the main, mm, and the main thread will read the, read the length of the vector. And the Rust will reject it, complaining that there is a borrow of moved value. And this is because the threads in Rust request the ownership of the data it captures, and then the ownership system will effectively preclude all other aliases to those pieces of data. And so far, so good. And where is the problem then? So the thing is that the global alias prevention principle of Rust will obstruct or, uh, with uh, existing programming patterns. Um, so Rust is well known to, to, be, uh, to, to need a brand new mindset, mindset for, for writing Rust program. And uh, the classical examples are secret data structures and uh, arbitrary uh, aliasing patterns. So let's see a concrete example where Rust clashes with uh, some uh, mm, programming patterns that use alias. Uh, so first, uh, we have a 2D vector. And then we have a function that updates either dimension of vector based on some uh, condition. And uh, the main function attempts to increment either dimension of a vector and at the same time store the old value. And uh, there's no data race at all. Uh, but of course, Rust will not accept it, so it will complain there are two multiple borrows to the same piece of data. 
So we are not trying to criticize in Rust for its ownership principles, of course, because the benefits of the ownership system extend far beyond just data risk prevention, like it enables uh, some compiler optimizations and uh, enables safe and efficient memory management. Uh, but uh, indeed, the clash with the existing programming patterns make it difficult to introduce these uh, mechanisms into existing languages and existing code bases. So, uh, and uh, on the other hand, those existing code bases and the languages, they will benefit a lot from just uh, safe concurrency, even without those uh, other things guaranteed by Rust. So there's something to be done here. And uh, what can we do? So now let's present our system. Uh, so first, let's see an example in our system. So this is the Scala equivalent of the effective example, and it relies on multiple aliases, but it's data race free. So our system is flexible enough to accept it. And uh, now, let's say someone wants to do a parallel update on both fields of uh, VEC2 at the same time. And uh, in the main function, given some VEC2, we want to increment both dimensions of it and at the same time calculate the, the summation of old values. And there is indeed a data race in this program. So uh, then in our system, the part update function will not type check. So the system will complain that we cannot show separation between PF and PG. Uh, but par update function makes uh, perfect sense, and uh, we can actually make it type check by adding some uh, separation annotations. And uh, here, these two sets are called separation degrees. Separation degrees, they signify what a variable should be separated from. And uh, intuitively, for example, the separation degree of G means that G should be separated from both P and F. Uh, so using P, F, and G in parallel will not induce any data race. Uh, and if we do that, if we add this annotation, the type error will move to the application side of power update. Um, so here we complain that we cannot establish the separation between sum and sum itself. And this makes perfect sense because it's uh, indeed well the data races. And uh, now uh, let's uh, take a closer look at our system. Uh, so our system is a, a lean approach to safe concurrency. So let's first explain the most essential philosophy on underlying it. It consists of two parts or two steps. The first step is tracking. In this, step, in this step, aliases are tracked by the type system, but there is no alias controlling or prevention by default. So you are allowed to write your code the old way. You can make use of aliases, and the code will be accepted. It's just that our system will do our best to track these aliases. And then it's only when the data races become a concern, uh, so it's the second step, our system will look at these tracked aliases and let alias prevention mechanisms come, in, come into play so that we can obtain a static safe concurrency guarantee. Uh, so now we can focus on the first part. So the first part of our approach uh, relies on capturing types to track aliases in types. The capturing types, they are recently proposed approach uh, by our group for effect and resource checking, and it has become a, a experimental, of Scala, uh, experimental feature of Scala 3, and our calculus is based on the calculus of uh, capture types. So capturing types, uh, as its name suggests, uh, it tracks uh, captures in types, and the capturing type takes the following form. Uh, here, S is the shape type, like a function, a file handle, a database connection, or a mutable reference. And the C is a capture set, so it is a set of variables that uh, the values of this type can at most capture. So for instance, the uh, function from the previous example, uh, this function takes an integer, adds it to a mutable state, and returns the incremented integer. It has uh, this uh, capturing type. And the shape type part tells us that it is a function from int to int. And the capture set part tells us that it at most captures uh, some variable. And uh, the type speaks out the fact that this function can refer or reference the mutable state sum. So now let's uh, see a concrete example to see uh, how capturing types track aliases in action. So we have a mutable variable x and its pose, which uh, checks whether its value is positive and have ink, which uh, increments that mutable variable, and the check, which uh, checks whether the variable is positive and it gets disappointed, if not so. And finally, we want to parallelize ink and check, which clearly involves the data race. So what are the capturing types? 
uh, X has uh, this type, so the hat marks uh, something reference, uh, something that we have to track the reference to. So for in this case, we want to track references to X, and uh, uh, both this pose and this ink reference X. So the capturing types speak about it, and uh, check uses uh, this pose. So we can also see that in this type. Uh, so capturing types, uh, to conclude, tracks all these aliasing and referencing relations in the types, and intuitively, intuitively it's like uh, forming a reference uh, diagram or reference graph uh, in the type system. And uh, now that we have gathered these aliasing information in the type system, we are ready for the second part, which is uh, use this piece of information to control aliases when data races uh, become a concern. So, now let's just consider the sim simplest example. Let's say we have some uh, primitive uh, parallel operator which runs two computations in parallel. And here the double arrow T means a computation that returns the value of type T. And uh, how to make this uh, operator safe? So in other words, we want the type system to statically guarantee that the parallelized operations do not have data races. Uh, in our system, what we can do is to add some uh, separation degree annotation to the parameter. So here, we say that the separation degree of G is F. It means that G should be separated from F in the sense that using them in parallel does not lead to any data race. And uh, this is uh, a guarantee that will be ensured by the type system. And how is it ensured? We have, uh, we have uh, uh, something called uh, separation checking, which uh, uh, ensures uh, these, uh, these guarantees when applying functions. Uh, for instance, let's inspect the example of uh, this PAR application in the previous slide. Um, note that the PAR is uh, dependent, so uh, the type, uh, the, the separation degree of the parameter G depends on the parameter F. And uh, after type checking this subterm, uh, the type is uh, this one. So the function has a separating degree of ink. So it's expecting an argument that is separated from ink. And uh, here, then we, when we apply uh, type check this, this application, we will perform a separation checking to establish the separation between the argument, which is check, and the expected separation degree, which is ink here. And uh, this separation annotation is uh, denoted this way. Uh, this separation relation is denoted this way in our system. So how does separation checking work? Uh, so intuitively, it is like working the reference graph of uh, the two sides and to determine whether there are like uh, shared uh, mutations. So let's uh, take the previous uh, separation check as an example to find out whether separation between check and ink can be established. We first see the capturing type of check, which uh, has a reference to its pose. And then we can see that its pose uh, refers to X in its uh, capturing type. And then for the other side, we can find that ink refers to X as well. So there is a conflict. Uh, we will reject this check, and therefore type error will be issued for this application. So now let's talk about how our approach achieves better compatibility. So the first thing is good defaults. Although we add a new concept, separating degree, we have a, a default which is empty for it. So in the previous example, it's uh, actually like this. Uh, you, because we didn't uh, specify the separating degree of f, it will be empty. And the second point is uh, Okay, and the second point is opt-in controlling. Uh, when the parameter of a function has an empty uh, separating degree, it's, uh, the separating checking will be trivial, so it's like no separating checking uh, whatsoever. And uh, because uh, and uh, the implication of uh, this is that the old code without additional annotations will just compile. And uh, because uh, by default, separating check the separating degrees, they are empty, and uh, separating checking will just be trivial in these cases. And one may always uh, add more annotations uh, for better, safe uh, uh, concurrency guarantees. And I'd like to briefly mention the reader capabilities in the system. So given, so this denotes read-only access to a mutable state. Given a mutable state x, we can derive a reader capability rx from it. And with this type, this type reads uh, a read-only reference to x, and the read-only concurrent access would be safe. For instance, this code is free from data races and is also accepted by our system. Now, let me wrap up. 
so there are still other interesting things that I can't talk about due to the time limit. So first, our approach has been formalized as a calculus and with uh, an, uh, parallel semantics with some interleaving of evaluation, we prove the confluence of evaluation. So we formally prove the, the data risk freedom uh, uh, claim. And then the classic type sounders is also proven. And we also have a prototype implementation. So check our paper if we want to see more. And so here are the takeaways. Uh, we presented our work uh, as flexible type system for data risk pre prevention, and we track aliases by default, but only control them as one needs. So it's opting by its nature, so it's uh, quite compatible with the existing coding patterns. And thank you very much for listening. Here is my personal website. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any? Sorry, it's getting traditional, isn't it? Um, thanks again for an interesting talk and a really interesting system. Um, one, my main question is, in your capturing types, like you showed the, the curly bracket X, mm -hmm. how does that work when the captured reference is moved to a broader scope where X is no longer visible. Uh, in that case, we will consider X uh, being out of scope and it will be widened to some, some uh, thing called cap, which is a universal capability. And uh, the universal capability basically means uh, anything. So it's like a top type for... Right, but yep. presumably you then lose all resolution on being able to distinguish things. Uh, yes, and it will clash with uh, everything. Uh, right, okay. Separation checking. Right. I, 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 that's actually the best explanation I've heard of that about the capturing type stuff okay. forever. <laughs> um, Thank you. The other thing was you said you don't have to annotate things. Uh, yeah, but if you don't annotate things, do you then lose the data race guarantees? Uh, yes, uh, so by default, if, like peop the idea is that if uh, you are given a code base that uh, exists and that doesn't use any of the safe concurrency constructs, it will just compile, it will not break, it, you don't have to rewrite it, and what you do is uh, you slowly adding those uh, notations to the code base to achieve more and more guarantees. Right, but does the, does the system have to be fully annotated in order to actually get your data race freedom guarantee? Um, fully annotated, it uh, depends. Uh, so for instance, if uh, some, uh, some place you do need some annotations to make things work, um, it will not compile, like uh, you, you are lacking some separation degrees. <laughs> right, but if it's not annotated, mm -hmm. it, 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 it will run, but it will be racy. Uh, Yes, so, so I'm not trying to be a quick yeah. Question. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Uh, I was wondering about uh, what kind of guarantees does your type soundness property set aside? Uh, there's uh, three things. It's uh, the first two is classical like preservation and uh, and uh, and uh, progress, and uh, the other is uh, confluence. So. So the, the, the operational semantics has uh, some interleaving uh, uh, evaluation orders for those uh, parallel constructs. Yeah. But it, doesn't it doesn't tell you anything about data races? Like, you don't have guarantees about the original problem? Uh, well, it, so it depends how you uh, understand it. Like, uh, so uh, the confluence shows that whatever order your evaluation is, the result is it's always the same. So it's like implies data reason. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah. While, while you oh. um, uh, while you switch over, um, I guess um, the like following up on on James's question. Um, so, when do you actually like? So you you start with unannotated code, right? And that all works. And then you add some annotations. Um, like, what's basically the threshold that you have to go over to get any sort of soundness guarantees from those annotations? Like, as soon as you add one, is it that now your compilation might fail because you didn't add enough? Yeah. Okay. So just like, uh, um, for instance, if you have used some parallel operators and privacy, it's uh, unchecked, and then you add some uh, annotations, 
and now it becomes checked and there might be a bunch of test errors which shows possible data raises and uh, go through the system. Okay, cool, thank you.